Welcome back. I hope everybody had a good lunch today. I know that there are different choices. When I asked, Mediterranean, Mexican, gringo. <laughs> Lots of choices around here. Anyway, we are going to study, beginning on page 179, the third seal. And my goal this afternoon is to finish the third and fourth seals. And tomorrow we will dedicate probably the first two sessions in the morning to the fifth seal and the two sessions in the afternoon to seal number six. And then after that we still have the interlude, the sealing of 144,000 in chapter seven. And then we still have the seventh seal plus all of the all of the presentations at the end, the five that deal with the Sabbath, Sunday, seal of God, mark of the beast issue. So let's have a word of prayer, and uh, we'll begin. Father in heaven, thank you for the good uh, rest that we've been able to enjoy. And now as we gather once again, we ask for the guidance of your spirit. We ask that you will help us to understand how history has flowed and uh, how, what things are moving towards so that we can be prepared for the great events that will soon explode upon the world scene. Thank you, Lord, for the promise of your presence, and we claim that promise in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right, page 179. The third seal represents the period when Constantine favored the Christian church, and as a result, persecution ceased and the world entered the church. Let's read the verses that deal with this seal, with the third seal. Revelation 6, verses 5 and 6. We have several symbols here. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. So we have several symbols in this third seal. We have, first of all, a horse whose color is black. We have a, a rider on the horse who has a scales in his hand. And uh, this uh, rider of the horse is weighing wheat and barley. And we're going to talk about what the wheat and the barley represent. And then also we find the command not to hurt the oil or the wine. Now on the next page, let's take a look at the historical context, what we've studied so far and where we are at now. The white horse describes the victories of the early church, according to what we've studied. The red horse describes the imperial persecutions by the Roman emperors in the early centuries of the history of the Christian church. The black horse, which is the third seal, represents the infiltration of the church by the world. Now Satan, in the course of history, has used two methods to try and defeat God's people. The first method is by trying to kill them by persecution. And we find this method from the very beginning of human history. Cain killed Abel. And of course, it wasn't Cain by himself. Because first John chapter 3 verse 12 says that Cain was of the wicked one. In other words, Cain killed Abel because Satan was uh, in charge uh, behind the scenes and he influenced Cain to kill Abel. So the first method that Satan uses from the very beginning is to try and kill those who are faithful. When that doesn't work, the Satan changes his methodology. He says, if you can't fight them, join them. Because after Cain killed Abel, God brought, brought forth another seed, Seth. So the devil says, well, you know, I can't continue like this. You know, I kill one seed and God brings another seed, so I have to use a different method. So what he did at the time of the flood was that he mingled the sons of God, which is the righteous, with the daughters of men. And he was much more successful because the world that undoubtedly had millions of inhabitants 
only eight people were left on earth that were faithful to God. If God had not sent the flood, uh, the um, righteousness would have been totally uh, uprooted from the earth. So Satan uses two methods, persecution and infiltration. In the second seal we have persecution. In the third seal we have infiltration. Now in the next section we're going to find that the third seal, the black horse, is parallel to the third church period, the church of Pergamum. So Ephesus would be equivalent to the first seal, that is the apostolic church. Smyrna would be equivalent to the red horse, the second seal, and that's the persecuted church. And then Pergamum, the third church, would be the compromising church symbolized by the black horse of Revelation chapter 6. Now let's uh, read the note at the bottom here because uh, it's very important. Satan's throne was in Pergamum. That's what um, Revelation chapter 2 verse 13 says. The third seal is the transition period between the conversion of the Emperor Constantine and the rise of the papacy to supremacy. So in other words, it's the hinge between the persecuted church and the rise of the papacy in the year 538. Thus Pergamum is the connecting link between the pagan Roman Empire and papal Rome. During this period, the restrainer was removed. Who is the restrainer that restrains the man of sin from openly manifesting himself? It is the Roman Empire. As long as the empire is there, the papacy cannot rise to dominion because there's already somebody who is ruling. And so during this period, the restrainer was removed. And uh, I have here that we should study Romans 13, 1 through 5, so that the papacy could fully manifest itself. Now it's helpful, helpful for us to realize that the third church has a person that is mentioned in that church. And this person is an Old Testament figure. And that figure is Balaam. Now, we would have to go back to the Old Testament to study this story, to Numbers 22 through Numbers 24. I'll just give you a very brief summary of what happened in that time. Uh, in the Old Testament story, this is at the top of uh, page 181, in the Old Testament story, Balaam did his utmost to curse Israel from outside, but he could not. Because there was no iniquity in Israel, they had a proper and strong relationship with the Lord, and God protected the church. Satan could not conquer the church from outside, or Israel from the outside, so he infiltrated it with idolatry and fornication. Idolatrous pagan customs came into the church, as it did into Israel, through the influence of Balak, and Balaam, who was uh, doing the, the work for Balak. So idolatrous pagan customs, customs came into the church at this time, and the church committed spiritual fornication by linking up with the state, that's what the Bible calls fornication, spiritually speaking, and fell also into idolatry, or idol worship. These two sins were the very ones that Israel practiced on the borders of Canaan, and the church of the fourth century embraced when persecution ceased. Now I'm going to read you a passage that's not in the syllabus. This is found in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 451, about the Old Testament story. So you see that uh, because Satan was not able to eliminate Israel by, uh, you know, actually battling against them and destroying them physically, he said, well, you know, let's just infiltrate them with fornication and idolatry. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 451, Speaking about Balaam, he immediately returned to the land of Moab and laid his plans before the king, that is, before Balak. The Moabites themselves were convinced that so long as Israel remained true to God, he would be their shield. The plan proposed by Balaam was to separate them from God by enticing them into idolatry. If they could be led to engage in licentious worship of Baal and Ashtaroth, their omnipotent protector would become their enemy 
and they would soon fall prey to the fierce warlike nations around them. This plan was readily accepted by the king, and Balaam himself remained to assist in carrying it into effect. Balaam witnessed the success of his diabolical scheme. So the third church has the doctrine of Balaam, because that's the period of Constantine. It's the period of the black horse, when darkness comes into the church. Now, in Great Controversy, page 42, this one is not in the syllabus as well, Ellen White is obviously drawing on the story of Balaam to describe the period when compromise came into the church. This is how it reads. Because he was not able to destroy the church by persecution, Satan therefore laid his plans to war more successfully against the government of God by planting his banner in the Christian church. If Now listen carefully. If the followers of Christ could be deceived and led to displease God, then their strength, fortitude, and firmness would fail, and they would fall an easy prey. Do you see the parallel? Third church, doctrinal Balaam. Balaam could not curse Israel from outside, so he infiltrates Israel so that God takes away his protection, and as a result, the church falls. Now let's talk about this horse whose color is black. By the way, Jesus does not ride all these horses. <laughs> the devil is riding these horses, the red horse, the black horse, and the yellow horse, because Jesus does not persecute the church. And, uh, and you know, Jesus does not bring darkness into the church. Jesus doesn't bring death into the church. Jesus is the rider of the first horse. Now notice the color black. This is very interesting. We just noticed that when the church is persecuted, the title of the chapter is, what was the title of the chapter? Persecution in the early centuries. Now, notice what the next chapter is, an era of spiritual darkness. And we're going to see in a few moments that in the Bible, darkness is used synonymously with black. Are you following me? So, so Ellen White is following the seals. She first, in Acts of the Apostles, spe speaks about the conquests of the church. Then she goes to persecution in the early centuries. That's the second seal, the red horse, persecution. Then an era of spiritual darkness, which is the black horse. She's, she's commenting on the seals, even though she doesn't quote the verses. So you would never know unless you, unless you really look beyond uh, the Bible, uh, the references themselves. Ellen White underlined that the darkness grew ever deeper because the papacy undertook a war against the Bible. Now, Jesus is the incarnated Word of God, right? He's the Word of God in person, in other words. And where the Word is, there is what? Light and life. The Bible identifies light with what color? We've noticed this. Light is identified with white. We already noticed that. And here you have the verses. The written word of God is also what? Light. So Jesus is light and the written word is light. During the period of the white horse, God's people proclaim the word of God, which is light to the world. That's an era of white or light. God's word is the original light. And when it shines on God's people, they reflect the light to others. Where the Word of God is absent, there is what? There is darkness or blackness. So what begins to be replaced in uh, the times of Constantine, what, for what, with what is the Word of God replaced in the times of Constantine? Human traditions... And what is the greatest of those human traditions that's going to be the final controversy? Sunday worship came in during that period. So they started forsaking the, the Word of God, which is light, which is white, and what is the result? Darkness or black. Are you with me or not? Now let's notice several texts where you find darkness and black synonymous. Isaiah 50 and verse 3. God says, I clothe the heavens with what? With blackness. And I make sackcloth their covering. By the way, sackcloth was black. Notice Jude. 
12 and 13. Speaking about the, the, those who are beyond the point of no return, there, these are spots in your love feasts, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds. Late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the what? The blackness of darkness. So the black horse is a period of what? It's a period of darkness. Why is it a period of darkness? Because there is no light. And what is the light? The Word of God. Are you with me or not? Notice Proverbs 7 verse 9. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. Once again, black and dark are related to one another. Jeremiah 4 verse 28. For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be what? Be black, because I have spoken, I have purposed, and will not relent, nor will I turn back from it. The way of the righteous is what? Light. But the way of the wicked is darkness. Notice Proverbs 4, 18 and 19. But the path of the just is as a, the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as what? Darkness they know not at what they stumble. Notice this interesting comment, powerful comment. Actually, there's several here where Ellen White also, in harmony with the Bible, relates the idea of darkness and the color black. God desires His people to be what? Light. The white horse. God desires to see His people to be light bearers to a world lying in the midnight darkness. But if they refuse to go forward in the light, which He causes to shine on their pathway, the light will finally become to them what? Darkness. And now notice, and instead of being light bearers to the world, they themselves will be lost in the what? In the blackness that surrounds them. Do you see once again the idea of darkness and blackness together? Because where there is darkness, there is no light, and the Word of God is light. So at this time, the Word of God is being supplanted by what? By human traditions. Here's another statement from Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 20. The hour of hope and pardon was fast passing. This is for the Jewish theocracy. The cup of God's long-deferred wrath was almost full. The cloud that had been gathering through the ages of apostasy and rebellion now black with woe, was about to burst upon a guilty people. So what does black represent? Apostasy and rebellion, according to this. In the Spalding McGann collection, page 153, once again, the idea of black and darkness are related. He calls upon His servants to receive from the Holy Spirit His sanctifying power, that the light may shine forth in clear, distinct rays. Amid the constantly increasing moral darkness, which is becoming, what? As black as sackcloth of hair all over our world. Creatures of the night roam and thrive in darkness. Bats, rats, roaches, germs are in the realm of darkness. The black horse stands in contrast to the white horse. During the period of the white horse, God's people radiated the light of God's Word. The black horse represents darkness that came in from a rejection of God's Word. Where God's Word is not, there is darkness or blackness. Black represents sin, apostasy, error, heresy, and human traditions. So far, so good? Now, there's another thing that is mentioned here in uh, this uh, particular seal. Not only darkness or, or blackness, but also uh, bread is mentioned. More specifically, wheat and barley. By the way, those were the two uh, grains that were used to bake bread in Israel. So when you talk about wheat and barley, you're talking about making bread with the wheat and with the barley. The barley was, uh, was the harvest at the time of Passover, early in the spring. 
and the wheat harvest was at the time of Pentecost, about 50 days later you had the, the harvest of the wheat. They were the grains that were used to make bread. Now let's continue here with this in mind. Another symbol for God's Word is bread. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. During the third seal there was not only a scarcity of light, in other words darkness, but also a scarcity of what? Of bread. We're going to notice that in a few moments. Two ways of saying the same thing. This is the reason why wheat and barley during this period were extremely expensive. When human traditions suppress the Word of God, the result is darkness or blackness, and the result of the darkness is famine, pestilence, which exist in the period of the fourth horse. In short, both light and bread symbolize the Word of God. Where there is no light and no bread, there is death. Amos 8, 11, and 12, which we're going to read later, predicts a time when there will be famine in the land. Not famine for bread, but famine for what? For the Word of God. Let me ask you, was the Word of God scarce? Did it become scarce during the times of Constantine and intensify as time went on? Absolutely. Let's notice on page 184, uh, Revelation 6, verse 6, And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. Now, what we're going to notice is very, very important. The purpose of scales in the third seal is to weigh grain, right? Because it's grain that's mentioned. Elsewhere in Scripture, the scale or balance can represent what? Can represent judgment. But remember that symbols are what? Flexible. They don't, don't always mean the same thing. So every time that you find the word scale in the Bible doesn't mean judgment. Here it means that the grains are being weighed and they're very scarce because the Word of God is becoming scarce. So the purpose of the scales in the third seal was to weigh grain. Elsewhere in Scripture the scale or balance can represent judgment, but not in the third seal. Barley, the early spring harvest, and wheat, the late spring harvest, were staple, cro staple crops that Israel used to make bread. These grains were very scarce during the period of the third horse, during the dark period. The famine during the period of the third horse will intensify and bring about even worse famine and death during the period of the fourth horse because the fourth horse is a pale horse. It's the horse of death. And when there is famine, there is pestilence, and where there is famine and pestilence, there is death. Now, the next paragraph. Revelation 6 verse 6 describes scarcity of bread because the wheat and the barley were extremely expensive. A denarius was the daily wage of a common laborer. Thus a laborer was only making enough to purchase one quart of wheat and three quarts of barley. Wow, that would lead to starvation, wouldn't it? Especially if he has a family. According to the Roman historian Cicero, who lived around that same time, the price mentioned by John would have been 8 to 16 times higher than normal. So was it very expensive to make bread? There was a scarcity of bread. During the third seal there was famine for bread in the land. Barley was a staple used to feed very poor, the very poor and animals. It is no coincidence that the fourth horse is pale because the result of famine is what? Death. J. A. Sice, who um, was, uh, wrote a commentary on Revelation, he's not a Seventh-day Adventist, uh, it's a very, very interesting commentary, lots of good insights, of course lots of things that Adventists would not agree with, with but it's, it's a good commentary that has many uh, insights, uh, wrote this, In ordinary times, a denarius would buy 24 senexes of barley, but here a denarius will buy only three. 
the scanty allowance for a day's subsistence for a slave. The arrival of things at such a pass accordingly argues a severity of hard times, distress and want, almost beyond the power of imagination to depict. So the Word of God is becoming scarce. Darkness, blackness is coming into the church because the church is no longer sharing the light. Darkness is entering the church. The Word of God is scarce, very expensive. Notice Amos chapter 8 verses 11 and 12. Once again, bread is related to uh, abundance or famine. It says there, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God. And Ellen White applies this, these verses incidentally to uh, after the close of probation when people are going to seek the Word of God and they're not going to find it. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing what? The words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, and from north to east, they shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. So where there is a scarcity of bread, famine ensues. And when the famine intensifies, the result is death. You have a living example of that in Venezuela right now. Now, what about the oil and the wine? The wine or libation was a symbol of the blood of Jesus, and the oil is a symbol of what? Of the Holy Spirit. Ellen White makes the following important statement. In order to secure man to himself and ensure his eternal salvation, Christ left the royal courts of heaven and came to this earth, endured the agonies of sin and shame in man's stead, and died to make him free. In view of the infinite price paid for man's redemption, how dare any professing the name of Christ treat with indifference one of his little ones? How carefully should brethren and sisters in the church guard every word and action lest they hurt the oil and the wine? How patiently, kindly, and affectionately should they deal with the purchase of the blood of Christ? To hurt God's people is to despise what? To despise the blood of Christ and to offend whom? And to offend the Holy Spirit who might be working upon that human heart. Luke 10 verse 34 speaks about the parable of the Good Samaritan. What were the healing uh, agencies in the story of the Good Samaritan? Oil and wine. Uh, did the Good Samaritan treat this individual uh, properly, the way he should, using these remedies? Did the priest do it? No, the priest didn't do it. Did the Levite do it? No, no, they mistreated. Who were they really mistreating? They were mistreating Christ, and they were mistreating the Holy Spirit. So it says there, So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, which are the healing agencies, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Now notice on the next page all of the verses that say that whoever touches one of Christ's children actually is touching the Lord. Zechariah 2 verse 8, Whoever pokes the eye of one of God's people is poking God's eye. I'm now paraphrasing. For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. In other words, to touch the, one of the children of Jesus is to touch whom? Is to touch Jesus. You know Matthew 25 and verse 40, And the king will answer to them, this is uh, uh, the, the sheep, parable of the sheep and the goats, Assuredly I say to you, in as much as you did it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to whom? You did it unto me. Mark 9 verse 41, For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, Jesus says, because you belong to Christ, assuredly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. 
And of course, you all, all know about Saul of Tarsus. He was on his way to Damascus. I've been to the place where supposedly this occurred. It was uh, in May of 2001, just a few days, be just a few months before uh, the Twin Towers came down. So now you can't go over there because it's a war zone. But um, we went to Damascus. I preached. Uh, I didn't. I, I didn't preach in Syria because it's forbidden for foreign pastors to preach in Syria. I preached in Lebanon and also in Jordan. I went with Sarkis Kanablian from the Fresno Central Church, and uh, it reminded me when I was there of this particular episode, where Saul is on the way to persecute the Christians. And suddenly, a voice comes from heaven, knocks him to the ground, and says, "Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me?" And uh, you know, he's probably wondering, I'm not going up, I'm going to, to Damascus. Who are you that I'm persecuting? And what was the answer? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. So to persecute a follower of Jesus is to persecute Christ. It's to hurt the wine, the blood for which Jesus, that Jesus gave for the salvation of souls. And also, it hurts the Holy Spirit who is working upon human hearts to woo them and bring them to Christ. Now, let's read what Ellen White has to say about the third seal. As noted before, Ellen White described this period in the chapter of the Great Controversy titled, An Era of Spiritual Darkness. In several statements in the chapter, she refers to the darkness that came into the church after Constantine's conversion, in quotation marks, to Christianity. Let's read some of those statements. The accession of the Roman Church to power marked the beginning of the Dark Ages. As her power increased, what happened? The darkness deepened. Great Controversy, page 57, the darkness seemed to grow denser. Great Controversy, page 60, but the noon of the papacy was what? The midnight of the world. The Holy Scriptures, why were they in darkness? Notice, the Holy Scriptures, which are light, by the way, were almost unknown, not only to the people, but to the priests. In Great Controversy, page 79, the world had passed its midnight. This is uh, uh, talking about John Wycliffe, who is the, uh, the morning star of the Reformation. The hours of darkness were wearing away, and many lands appeared, in many lands appeared tokens of the coming dawn. Now it's significant that Ellen White dedicates three pages on the issue of the change of the Sabbath during this era of spiritual darkness, because Sunday worship entered the church during the period of whom? During the period of Constantine. 1 John chapter 2, verses 8-11 through 11 explains that those who are in darkness, they hate their brother. So the, so, so the result of darkness is what? Persecution. Those who are in darkness hate their brother. Let me ask you, when the darkness entered the church, did the nominal church begin persecuting those that didn't agree with the church? Yes. Absolutely. So those, uh, those that are in darkness hate their brother and want to kill them. The darkness of the third horse leads those who are in darkness to want to kill those who are in the light. The darkness and famine of the third seal leads to death and the grave in the fourth, which we're going to talk about later. Now, Ellen White has several statements where she describes uh, what happened during this period. Very perceptive what she writes. The spirit of what? Compromise and conformity, with the world that is, was restrained for a time by the fierce persecutions, which horse would that be? The red horse, right before. Was restrained for a time by the fierce persecutions which the church endured under paganism. But as persecution ceased, what horse would that be? It would be the, the black horse, right? Per, the, the persecution is the third horse, but when it ceases, that is the black horse. And Christianity entered the courts and palaces of kings. She laid aside the humble simplicity of Christ and his apostles for the pomp and pride of pagan priests and rulers. And in place, listen carefully now, and in place of the requirements of God, 
Where are the requirements of God revealed? In the Bible. She substituted human theories and traditions. And then she refers to Constantine. The nominal conversion of Constantine in the early part of the 4th century, that's the period of the black horse, caused great rejoicing. And the world, cloaked with the form of righteousness, walked into the church. Now the work of corruption rapidly progressed. Paganism, while appearing to be vanquished, what would vanquished mean? Defeated. Overcome, right? So, in reference to the, the, the first horse. The church went out conquering and the conquered, to overcome. But now darkness comes into the church and it says paganism, while appearing to be vanquished, became the conqueror. Her spirit controlled the church, her doctrines, ceremonies, and superstitions were incorporated into the faith and worship of the professed followers of Christ. So did Satan change his strategy under the third seal? Yeah. It says persecution. By the way, did persecution decimate the church? Did the persecution against the church, did it make the church smaller? Are you kidding? The church became larger and larger. More and more people joined the church because they said, hey, if people are willing to die for this, then it must be, must be worth living for. <laughs> These people really believe this. If they're willing to die for it, wow, there's something in this. Let's check it out. Ellen White wrote in Great Controversy, page 42, Satan therefore laid his plans to war more successfully against the government of God by planting his banner in the Christian church. If the followers of Christ could be deceived and led to displease God, then their strength, fortitude, and firmness would fail and they will fall, would fall easy prey. Did they fall easy prey? Yes, they most certainly did. Uh, listen to this statement. The great adversary now endeavored to gain by artifice, that's under the third seal, the black horse, what he had failed to secure by what? Force, that's the second horse. Persecution ceased. In other words, the persecution under, this, under the red horse ceases, and in its stead were substituted the dangerous allurements of temporal prosperity and worldly honor, which is which seal? The seal of darkness. Idolaters were led to receive a part of the Christian faith, while they rejected other essential truths. They professed to accept Jesus as the Son of God and to believe in His death and resurrection. But they had no conviction of sin and felt no need of repentance or a change of heart. With some concessions, now listen carefully to the terminology, with some confess, concessions on their part, they proposed that Christians should make concessions that all might unite. Oh, this was an ecumenical age. That all may unite on the platform of belief in Christ. Let's set aside the doctrines and just come together on what we have in common. Nothing new under the sun. In the book, Christ Triumphant, this is not in your uh, syllabus, you might want to write it down, Christ Triumphant, page 319, Ellen White describes uh, the period of the persecution of the church. In vain were Satan's efforts to destroy the church by violence. The great controversy in which the disciples of Jesus yielded up their lives did not cease when those faithful standard bearers fell at their post. By defeat, they conquered. God's workmen were slain, but His work went steadily forward. The gospel continued to spread, and the number of its adherents to increase. Said a Christian, expostulating with the heathen rulers who were urging forward the persecution, he said, you may torment, afflict, and vex us. Your wickedness puts our weakness to the test, but your cruelty is of no avail. It is but a stronger invitation to bring others to our persuasion. The more we are mowed down, the more we spring up again. The blood of Christians is seed. Tertullian, one of the church fathers said that. So Satan says, hey, the more I persecute, the more they grow. I got to go to plan B. Because the whole empire is becoming Christian. Paganism is being defeated. Here's another statement. This is also on page 188, Great Controversy, page 43. Others were in favor of yielding 
or modifying some features of their faith and uniting with those who had accepted a part of Christianity. Does that sound familiar? Urging that this might be the means of their full conversion, that was a time of deep anguish to the faithful followers of Christ. Under a cloak of pretended Christianity, Satan was insinuating himself into the church to corrupt their faith and to turn their minds from what? From the word of truth, which leads to darkness. Great Controversy, page 45. But there is no union between the Prince of Light and the Prince of Darkness. In other words, there's no union between white and black. And there can be no union between their followers. When Christians consented to unite with those who were but half converted from paganism, they entered upon a path which led further and further from what? Further and further from the truth. Now I want to read you some statements that are not in the syllabus. I can actually copy this off if you want me to. Um, these are from authors that are not Seventh-day Adventists. They're not Seventh-day Adventists. I'm going to read three of them. One is Dave Hunt, Global Peace, pages 106 and 107. Let me tell you something about Dave Hunt. Uh, Dave Hunt uh, was an evangelical, he died a few years ago, an evangelical writer. Uh, who believed that the harlot of Revelation chapter 17 is the papacy, but he believed that the little horn is a future antichrist, he believed in the rapture of the church, etc. But he believed that the seven churches represent seven periods, just like we do. And he describes the third period of the Christian church uh, in the following way, uh, Global Peace 106 and 107. So you see that it's not only Ellen White that has seen this in the times of Constantine, there are other Christian writers that also have seen that happen in the course of Christian history. He's speaking about Constantine and he wrote, A brilliant military commander. Constantine also understood that there could be no political stability without religious unity. Yet to accomplish that feat would require a union between paganism and Christianity. How could it be accomplished, he asks. The empire needed an ecumenical religion that would appeal to every citizen in a multicultural society. So what, uh, what, became the, uh, what became the way in which everybody could come into the church? Not what the Word of God says, culture. Wow, if that doesn't sound familiar today that culture dictates what the church should do. You know, if LGBT is, is, is accepted in the world, we say, you know, the church needs to accommodate to that. You know, if the world says gay marriage, well, you know, if the world says that, that women in the church should occupy the same position, uh, leadership positions as men, well, you know, we, we need to just go along with culture. We need to follow. He's writing here about this period of the Christian church. The empire needed an ecumenical religion that would appeal to every citizen in a multi multicultural society. Giving Christianity official status was not enough to bring internal peace to the empire. Christianity had to undergo a transformation so that pagans could convert without giving up their old beliefs and rituals. Constantine himself exemplified this expediency. Isn't that a telling statement? This next statement is from Henry Cardinal Newman, a Roman Catholic Cardinal. Catholic Church doesn't hide the idea that, mo that many of the things that are, that are in the Catholic Church actually come from paganism. They don't try to hide it. They say, you know, wherever we go, we just baptize the heathen customs <laughs> and let people continue practicing their heathen customs as long as they become members of, of the Roman Catholic Church. They don't try to hide that. Notice what Henry Cardinal Newman had to say. We are told in various ways by Eusebius. Do you know who Eusebius was? He was a historian of the Christian church that lived in the times of Constantine. He was actually Constantine's historian. We are told in various ways by Eusebius that Constantine, in order to recommend the new religion to the heathen, 
transferred into it the outward ornaments to which they had been accustomed in their own. In other words, he says, well, you know, if they, if they worship the sun, let's just say that they're worshiping the S-O-N instead of the S-U-N. And, you know, instead of saying that they're supposed to keep Sunday because the, they're honoring the sun god, let's just say that they're honoring Jesus' resurrection. He continues writing, it is not necessary to go into a subject which the diligence of Protestant writers has made familiar to most of us. The use of temples and these dedicated to particular saints. Let me see if I have this, the rest of this statement. Okay, here it is. The use of temples and these dedicated to particular saints and ornamented on occasions with branches of trees, incense, lamps, and candles, votive offerings on recovery from illness, holy water, asylums, holy days and seasons, use of calendars, processions, blessings on the fields, sacerdotal vestments, the tonsure, the ring in marriage, turning east, images at the latter date, perhaps the ecclesiastical chant, are all of pagan origin and sanctified by their adoption into the church. That happened during the period of Constantine. And what was the result? Darkness. What was the result? A scarcity of what? A scarcity of bread, which will lead to famine and to death under the fourth horse. I want to read now from Philip Schaff, great church historian. You can still get his, um, uh, his encyclopedia of the history of the Christian church. This is in volume 3, page 93. But the elevation of Christianity, this is interesting that he would say the elevation of Christianity. Do you know what the word Pergamum means? The word Pergamum means elevation. <laughs> See, from the valley of persecution under the second church, Smyrna, the church is now at the heights of prosperity. So he states, but the elevation of Christianity as the religion of the state presents also an opposite aspect to our contemplation. It involved great risk of degeneracy to the church. The Roman state, with its laws, institutions, and usages, was still deeply rooted in heathenism and could not be transformed by a magical stroke. The Christianizing of the state amounted therefore in great measure to the paganizing and secularizing of the church. Once again, the Christianizing of the state led to the paganizing and secularizing of the church. The world overcame the church as much as the church overcame the world. And the temporal gain of Christianity was in many respects canceled by spiritual loss. The mass of the Roman Empire was baptized only with water, not with the spirit of the gospel, and it smuggled heathen manners and practices into the sanctuary under a new name. The very combination of the cross with the military ensign by Constantine was the most doubtful omen, portending an unhappy mixture of the temporal and the spiritual powers. Interesting, isn't it? So are you catching a glimpse here of, uh, of what's involved with the black horse? See, we're following the course of history. This is historicism. Historicism is simple, not complicated. It's the best way to interpret. You know, the, the evangelical churches, they say, well, you know, you have the rapture, and then you have all of these disasters in the seals. You're going to have the Antichrist riding on a white horse, and you know, you're going to have uh, all kinds of bloodshed with the sword, and you know, you're going to have uh, famine, and they usually consider it literal famine, and then you're going to have death in the grave, and then you're going to have the martyrs crying out because they've been killed, all after the rapture of the church. And preterists, they say all of this was fulfilled way back then during the period of the Caesars. 
So none of this, they say, applies to us today, because preterists say it all happened in the past, futurists say it all is going to happen in the future, so it has no significance and no meaning for us. But when you use historicism as the method, it's beautiful, because we can see the trajectory. We can see that God has given the entire history from the times of apostolic times through the persecutions of the Roman Empire, to darkness entering the church and a scarcity of bread, leading to death and the grave through persecution by the papacy and also by a lack of the word of God, which leads then to the martyrs to cry out, Until when, O Lord, do you not judge and avenge our blood on those who are shedding our blood in the earth? And then the martyrs, which is the group of martyrs that died during the Roman Empire and during the period of the papacy, they're told, no sweat. Rest a little while. You got your white robe. Don't worry about it. You're okay. You're safe. You died for the sake of the gospel. Just rest a little while until in the future the papacy resurrects from its deadly wound and persecutes again, and then you have all the rest of the martyrs. And then both groups will be rewarded. Are you with me or not? And then you have the signs. You have the, the great earthquake, and you have the, 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 the sun darkened and the moon that looks like blood and the falling of the stars, which are announcing that the judgment is about to begin, that it's going to set things straight. The cases of the martyrs are going to be looked at in the heavenly books. That's Daniel 7. And the cases that were decided wrongly on earth are now going to be rectified in the heavenly sanctuary. Are you with me? And then you have after that, uh, during the period of the sixth seal, you have those signs. And then between the signs and the last part of the sixth seal, you have the interlude, the sealing of the 144,000 right before the last part of the sixth seal. You have the sealing of the faithful to enter the time of trouble, to be protected in the time of trouble. And then they go through the time of trouble, and you come all the way to uh, page 641 of Great Controversy, and Jesus is descending from heaven. He's already begun his second coming. When he's part of the way down, oh, all of God's people who are on the earth, they still feel unworthy. They say, who shall be able to stand? And there's an awful period of silence in heaven. Are you with me? And after that long period of silence, the voice is heard saying, my grace is sufficient for you. And Ellen White says that their faces are light up and the burden is removed, and then Jesus descends from heaven. He comes the rest of the way, is above the earth, and he says, Arise, arise, you who sleep in the dust of the earth. Amen. And the dead in Christ rise first, in glorified form. The 144,000 have been glorified before that. Those of the special resurrection are there. Then all of God's faithful followers are caught up in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. And then... They're taken to heaven for a thousand years. We're just following the order of the book of Revelation, folks. <laughs> taken to heaven for a thousand years. And there, there will be a millennial judgment to reveal to God's people and uh, it, for, for God's people to pronounce sentence on the wicked that stayed behind based on what is found written in the books. And then... After the millennial judgment, Jesus returns with all the saints. The holy city descends after Jesus' feet fall upon the Mount of Olives. Everything opens into a great plain for the new Jerusalem to rest there, according to Zechariah 14, verses 4 and 5. The holy city descends. Jesus and the saints enter the holy city. The gates are closed. The wicked resurrect. Satan goes among them saying they're less in there than we are. We can conquer them. We can overcome them. And everybody gets ready for battle. Isn't this an exciting story? This is better than Hollywood. 
You know why it's better? Because it's the truth. <laughs> it's not imaginary. It's going to happen. I, I've, uh, many times I've wondered whether it would be nice for some studio to, to do, do a movie on this. But, you know, a movie based on what the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy say, not just imaginary stuff, because they add a lot of stuff that, that isn't in the story. And so, and so then, uh, all of the wicked resurrect. They prepare for battle. When they're about ready to attack, the panoramic view shows all of them why they were lost. And after they see the cases of their lives, they say, God is right. We're wrong. Just and true are your ways, O God. And they kneel. Satan kneels. His angels kneel before the majesty of God. For the first time since sin came into the world, the whole universe is agreed that God is right, sin and Satan are wrong, and only at that moment can sin and Satan and sinners be destroyed without any questions remaining. And fire descends from heaven, and fire destroys the wicked, destroys Satan and his angels, and after they burn out, God is going to make a new heavens and a new earth like existed at the beginning, where righteousness dwells. And thus, the great controversy is ended. And the whole universe will see that God is love. Do you know how the, great con the conflict series begins? God is love. Do you know how it ends? God is love. <laughs> so the whole universe will see that God was right. God is justice, but God is also love. Isn't that an exciting story? We need to make sure that we're inside the city, not outside. Don't let anything in this world keep you from being inside. You know, we, we think that we're going to live forever in this world and we have all these nice things. Folks, that's only to get us from point A to point B. That's only to survive until we get there. You know, the food that we eat and the house that we live in, the car that we drive, that's only, that's only a temporary thing to kind of bail us over until we get there. But our focus needs to be on heaven. You know, as, as the song says, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Some people say, as I was mentioning before, that you're so earthly minded, you're no heavenly good. And what I say uh, is that we're so earthly minded sometimes, so we're so heavenly minded sometimes that we're no earthly good either. So we have to have a balance. We have to be focused on this life, doing the work of God, but our focus on eternal life in heaven with Jesus.